Well, again, it's a great joy to join with you and study the Word of God together on Christmas Eve. Uh, really, this is uh, just a, a wonderful holiday for believers. It's wonderful certainly for all people, but it is especially sweet for us uh, because we know our Savior, we know our Lord, and we get to celebrate Him. Every holiday season, however, for the last number of years, there has been really a, a battle over Christmas. As our culture has become more and more secularized, fewer people are embracing the so-called true meaning of Christmas. How many of you have heard that, the true meaning of Christmas? People talk about that all the time. Christmas in recent years has become more, at least in our culture, about presents and about money and movies and music and feelings and Santa Claus and all these other things. And many have tried to really sanctify the holiday by holding up some sort of virtue and putting a banner for peace or for unity or for kindness, that somehow if you can just do good things for the Christmas season, you've captured the spirit of the holiday. And somehow that in and of itself is what Christmas is all about. But we have seen a reaction in the public square. There's really been sort of in response to that, sort of the, the, the dumbing down or the, the watering down of Christmas, there's been sort of a guerrilla movement of well-intentioned people who insist on saying Merry Christmas versus Happy Holidays, things like that. Or they wrestle for uh, local government to install uh, displays, manger displays in the center of town. Or they even lobby against coffee shops to keep the red cup. Remember the red cup? Remember the big controversy with the cups? There's all these different things that we do to sort of recapture the true meaning of Christmas, and we do so in very small ways. Now, an argument can be made that Christmas is really just a hallmark holiday of sorts, that really it was borrowed like many of our holidays from pagan celebrations, and then we Christianized it. On some level, that's certainly true. However, does that mean that a Christian should not celebrate Christmas? Should we refrain simply because the origins may be suspect? The holiday itself? Well, I'm of the opinion that if you have a culturally sanctioned opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ, you should certainly take it. But if you do, don't waste your capital fighting about things that don't really matter. See, while the Christmas holiday in December is not found in Scripture itself, in fact, Jesus is likely born in the Jewish month of Tishri, which is mid to late September, the Bible in many places does recount the glorious announcement and birth of Jesus Christ. And so, yes, the birth of Christ, the advent of Christ is there, and it is prominent in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel. See, Jesus was and is a real person whose life is recorded in all four Gospels and further attested to by other non-biblical sources. And so if Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, then we would do well to examine his birth. And by doing so, we will bring glory to God. There are many texts we could go to tonight, but in, in years past, we've done a lot of things. If you've been with us for a couple years, I've bounced around and tried to capture every single possible angle of Christmas from the scriptures. But tonight, I want to look at a birth announcement, the announcement of Jesus Christ coming to earth. It's not simply enough to affirm the historical fact that Jesus was born. I think there's more, more work to be done, a deeper uh, exploration into this, I think the bigger question is not just G did Jesus, uh, was Jesus born on earth, but the bigger questions are who is Jesus and why did he come to earth? If you can answer those questions, that's when you start to get to the true meaning of Christmas. And so for our time tonight, I want to have us turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. If you're using a pew Bible, I believe it's page 43, so the second half of your Bible, page 43, Luke chapter 1. Now, a lot happens in Luke chapter 1. There are 80 verses in this chapter, so to, to exposit all of that would take more time than we certainly have tonight. But Luke himself is careful to record not just the events of the birth of Jesus, but also of his forerunner, John the Baptist. However, starting in verse 26, we read that there is actually an account of an angel who comes to a young woman named Mary to tell her that she's about to carry a very special child. And so turn with me again, Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 26 to 38. Now I'm not going to go through every single detail of all of this, but I want to get the whole story, the whole context together. So look at this with me. Luke 1, 26. 
Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? But the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, again, we don't have time to go through every single one of these verses tonight, but I want to focus really on one part, one part of the angel's announcement for our time. This account really introduces Luke's uh, readers to Mary herself. This is the first time she appears in this gospel. And verse 26 says that it's in the sixth month, and we know that's connected to to Elizabeth's uh, time. Uh, But the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. He comes to her. Now, there's only two angels named in the scriptures, and it's Michael and it's Gabriel. But uh, contrary to popular belief, there are more angels with more names than just those two. Uh, But here is one of these named angels, Gabriel. Now we know that Mary, she has this soon-to-be husband, Joseph. They're in the small town of Nazareth, but they're soon going to travel to Bethlehem for the purpose of the Roman census. So they're going to go, and they're going to go and travel there, and that's where she's going to give birth to the son. But for now, they're in Nazareth. And where is Nazareth? Well, not even first century Jews oftentimes knew where this little town was. In fact, it was so small that Luke records that it's a city in the northern region of Galilee. He has to tell his readers where this little town is. Verse 27 says that Mary, this woman who is named, she is a virgin. She's never been with a man, never been with a husband. And this man, Joseph, will be her first and only husband. And so we find Mary, who is going about her business, And then an angel, the angel Gabriel, bursts in on her and surprises her. Look again at verses 28 and 29. Coming in, he said to her, greetings. Can you imagine just minding your own business and an angel coming in and saying, greetings, favored one. Shocked. Surprised. He says, the Lord is with you. But verse 29, she doesn't respond the way that you you and I might think that she would excited and happy to see him. She's perplexed. She's very perplexed at the statement. And she kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. What's going on? Why, why are you here? This, this meeting of Gabriel and Mary, he calls her favored one. Favored one. The original Greek word that's used here is charis. It's grace. Early Latin translations of this were, uh, was, was gratia plena, full of grace. This is where we get the, the term Mary, full of grace. It's from this designation here. This is where we get the idea that, that Mary, yes, full of grace, but how do we understand this to be? How is it that Mary is full of grace and favored of God? Well, it's not that she has this grace in and of herself. The reason that she has this, this grace is because God has chosen to put his grace on her. He has found, she has found favor with him because he favors her by bringing this child into her being. She's favored by God that he is choosing to set his love and set his grace upon her. What a marvelous thing. What a great joy she would experience in carrying this child. And later on, she writes or she says that she treasures all these things in her heart. What a blessed joy that she has the opportunity, the privilege, the honor of carrying the Lord Jesus Christ in her womb. But just why the angel comforts her and says, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid. He's with you. This is a good thing. 
Because again, an angel comes to you, you don't know what's, you don't know what's going on. But he's, and it says that she was very perplexed. The Greek is really uh, agitated, even disturbed. She's bothered by this. Why? Well, because she's never encountered an angel before. She doesn't know what to expect. And furthermore, she's wondering why an angel would be coming to her. Am I in danger? Am I in trouble? Did I do something wrong? Why am I getting visited by this angel? Her mind must have been racing, which is why he comforts her in verse 30. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid. And he says, for you have found favor with God. Why did God choose her? Why, did God, why does God choose anybody? I don't know. It's for his own providence, for his own joy, for his own pleasure. God chooses to set his love and his favor on people because he's the sovereign Lord. He does whatever he wishes, whatever pleases him. But God has chosen her for a special task. What is it? Verse 31. He says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Well, my friends, this is not just a, a heavenly birth announcement. This is also a gender reveal party. He tells her that she's going to have a son. This is 2,000 years before sonograms, but she now knows that she's going to have a son. And more than this, he tells her the name. You're going to call him Jesus. It's marvelous, really. But now she's come to realize that she's going to be pregnant, even though she's not even yet married to Joseph. She's never even been with him. They're betrothed, certainly, but she's a virgin. She's never known a man. But she will carry a child, a son. And more than this, he'll be called Jesus, which means God saves. Now, customarily, it is the father's privilege to name the child in this culture, but in this case, Joseph, the adoptive father, is not going to name him. Instead, the heavenly father is going to name his son and calls him Jesus, Jehovah saves. Of course, we know that Isaiah 7.14, there's a prophecy given here. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a, a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. This has been prophesied 700 years before this actually took place. They were waiting for this, but they just didn't know how or why. But now the Lord God, the saving God, the almighty God, would soon, within a span of nine months, be quite literally with them. Emmanuel. God is coming. He's coming to earth, and he's going to come to earth through her womb. This announcement is very similar to the one that Joseph receives in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. The same thing, he tells them, the, the angel says uh, that, that Mary is with child by the way of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So the angel tells Joseph the exact same thing he tells Mary. But then he adds this, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now, we see the purpose. This is why Jesus has come to earth. Joseph gets this information in Matthew's Gospel. Why does Jesus come? Jesus has come to save people from their sins. This is the, this is the message. This is why Christmas matters. This is why his life and his death and his resurrection matters because Jesus is coming to save people like you and people like me. But he doesn't tell this information to Mary. Ever wonder why? Why doesn't he say this to Mary? Well, frankly, it's not quite important yet for her. See, Joseph needs to know that A, Mary has been faithful, so he tells, he, the angel tells him that. B, that the, the, Bible, uh, the, that the baby is divinely conceived. That's how your wife is going to be pregnant, even though you haven't been married yet. This is the, the divine conception here. And see that he's coming to save the world. So there's a sense of mission here. Joseph needs to understand the mission because, and I tend to think that he needs to know this because he's about to go and prepare himself to go and protect his wife, protect his son, and lead them in the way, the earthly way. He has a job to do. And so the angel, by the providence of God, gives Joseph everything he needs to go and lead his family on earth and protect them for the mission. But Mary doesn't need this information right now. She doesn't need to know any of that. All she needs to know is who her child really is. 
That's what a mother wants to know, right? Who is this baby inside of me? Who am I nurturing in my own body? Who am I praying for? Who am I caring for? Who am I waiting to see? Who's kicking me in the ribs at night, right? They want to know, who is this? Who am I carrying inside of me? And the angel tells her, it's going to be a son. His name is Jesus. But then he says something that Joseph doesn't hear. Something else. Look at verses 32 and 33. He will be great. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Wow. That's remarkable. Who is this inside my my belly? Let me tell you. Five declarations about the identity of Jesus Christ. Five amazing things that he has to say to this young girl, this young woman, about who she's carrying in her womb. And each of these statements is connected by the Greek word chi. He adds to it, and this, and this, and this, and this. All of these statements strung together as one prophecy, one declaration here. Connecting them all together to show that this is a remarkable person. And that's what I want to spend our time on here for the rest of our time here is what does this have to do with with Jesus and why is this here? Because after all, the big question is this. Well, if Jesus is coming to save people from their sins, if that's the mission to save, what kind of person is able to save people from their sins? Why does it matter that Jesus has come? Who is Jesus? Why do we need to know this information? That's why the angel, I believe, tells her all of this so that she can know and so that we can know who Jesus really is. We're going to take a look at this. Five things, five things the angel says in this little section here. The first declaration pertains to Jesus' unqualified greatness. His unqualified greatness. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 32. He says simply this, He will be great. That's it. That's all he has to say about that. Really, this might seem like an understatement, but it's actually a marvelous statement in its simplicity. Let me tell you why. Notice that the angel never says how Jesus will be great. He's going to be a great this. He's going to be a great leader. Other places in in history, other places in the Bible, greatness is qualified. He's going to be a great warrior, a, a great teacher. He's going to be a great this, a great that. This is unqualified. We don't know what kind of greatness he's going to have, which brings us to this conclusion, and many scholars have seen this. This is unqualified, and the only times that we see unqualified greatness assigned to a person is when the Bible talks about God. That's the only time. Greatness is unqualified when it's God because God is great. Let me just give you a couple examples. Psalm 48, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Period. End of sentence. Unqualified. Psalm 86.10, for you, O Lord, are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Period. Psalm 135.5, for I know that the Lord is great and our Lord is above all gods. Top tier. Absolute top of the pile. Great in every respect. Period. Psalm 145.3, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. God is great. No qualifier. Isn't that remarkable? And that's what's used here of Jesus. The angel assigns greatness to Jesus in the only way that is given, in the same way is given, assigned to God. Unqualified greatness. Really remarkable when you think about it. And then he adds to that. He says, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. In the Bible, this title, the Most High, or the name the Most High, is a designation for Jehovah God. He's not just any old false god or some god other people worship in pagan cultures. No, this is the supreme God, the sovereign Lord, the Most High. There's no one like him. There isn't even anyone around him. He is the only true God. We first see this title in Genesis 14 and all throughout Scripture. All throughout Scripture. 
in the Hebrew understanding, this has been uh, seen here, that the, 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 the designation, the son of, to say that you're a son of someone is really to be regarded just like them. So even in our days, you know, when you see a, a son who's just like his father, you wouldn't say he's the son of this or the son of that, but you'd say he's a chip off the old block. He's just like his dad. That's the same idea here. To be a son of someone else is to be just like them. So to be regarded as the son of the Most High God is to be just like Him. He's to be identified with God, with the Most High. That's not assigned to anybody else. No one else is likened to the Most High God. This is a, a statement of exclusive deity. That Jesus is God. No one else like Him. He's the Son of the Most High God. He's just like God because He is God. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Talking about Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And then there was nothing created that was made that has not come through Him. So Jesus Himself is God. And later in John chapter 10 verse 30, Jesus declared, I and the Father are one. Jesus Himself says this very same thing. I'm not just the Son of and just like Him. I am one with the Father. I am God. People oftentimes will make the, the foolish claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. In John chapter 8, at the end of the discourse, when they ask him, who are you? He says, oh, Abraham longed to see my day. He says, Abraham? He says, before he, he says you're not even 50 years old yet. What are you talking about, Abraham wait, waited to see your day? And then he says this, Jesus tells the crowd this, before Abraham was born, I am. I am is the name for God. He's claiming eternality. He's claiming deity. He's claiming sovereignty. Jesus is truly God. And so the angel's telling Mary, Mary, you're not just carrying a baby. You're carrying the incarnate God in your womb. That's why you're blessed. That's why you're favored. No one else has this. Next he says, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. It's interesting to note that both Mary and Joseph are physical descendants of King David. If you follow out their genealogy, uh, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, you follow those out, the genealogies of, of uh, Mary and Joseph, they all are traced back to David. They're descendants of David. But 2 Samuel chapter 7 prophesied that Israel would one day receive an eternal king who would sit on the throne of David forever. And Jesus is that prophesied king. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. That's what anointed one means, Messiah. And Messiah is a Hebrew word for the Greek word Christ. It's all the same thing. Christ, Messiah, anointed one, the anointed Savior, the anointed King. That's who Jesus is. And so while earthly kings will scramble around and try to steal power from each other to reign for a short bit of time, the angel says that the Lord God will give Jesus the throne of his father David, the prophesied Messiah. And in doing so, verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. This is eternal. The house of Jacob is a reference to Israel. Jesus is the promised king of Israel. But again, connected to that promise made to David is the eternal kingship of God's, over God's people. This is not just going to be a couple of years, a few decades. He doesn't just get 50 years or 60 years or 70 years. He gets eternity as king over the house of Israel and as we know from Daniel chapter 7 over the whole world. Daniel notes that Christ's dominion is over all peoples, nations, and men of every language. Jesus is not just the king over Israel, even though he is Israel's king. He is king over every nation. He's king over this nation. Whether or not people recognize him, it doesn't make a difference. He is king. That's who he is. He is the everlasting sovereign. And that's what Gabriel says at the very end here. He says his kingdom will have no end. That's everlasting sovereignty of Jesus Christ. And so it's not just that the baby was born to a virgin. That's not the story. That's not the whole story. That's certainly part of it. Or that somehow this arrival motivated some kind of tender and mild euphoria. Because we all love the image of a baby in the arms of his mother. 
That would inspire the whole world. And make no mistake about it, God Himself came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. It's more than the virgin. It's more than the manger. It's more than the baby. It's more than the feelings and the wise men and the gifts and the Christmas and everything like that. It's more than this. This is about the eternal God coming to earth, wrapping Himself in a human body, being born the way that all of us are, living a perfect life on this earth, teaching and living and loving and doing miracles proving His deity, proving His righteousness, and then dying on the cross and giving His life to pay for the sins of you and me. And then rising the third day victorious to bring that life to all who would turn and trust Him. Jesus came in pure, unqualified greatness of exclusive deity, God in human flesh, the prophesied Messiah, the eternal King, the everlasting Sovereign. That's what the angel is telling her in this message. Isn't this remarkable? Did, what would you do, mothers, all the mothers in the room, what would you do if an angel came and told you all these things about your child? Would, you not, would your heart not leap? Would you not be excited? Would you not treasure these things in your heart? And would you not weep at the cross when you saw your perfect son give his life for you? Remarkable. He came to earth to do what we could not do. And that would be save ourselves. We can't do it. He came to earth to do what only God can do. That's why these verses matter. Because only Jesus is great and the son of the most high God and only the king of the, of the universe, of the whole world. And he came to save us from the wrath of God, from the judgment of God, unto everlasting life. This is the message of Christmas. That Jesus Christ came to give his life for sinners. And so I would plead with you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I don't know where all of you are, I don't know all of you, But wherever you are in this life, is there no better time than now to give your life to Jesus Christ if you haven't? To stop running around and having another Christmas where you're just, I'm going to do better this year? Or would you recognize that I've turned against God, that I can't do this on my own, that my sins are too great? And would you receive the gift of eternal life offered to you 2,000 years ago to pay for your sins, that you would accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Savior, to, to turn from your sins and trust in Him. Would you do that this Christmas? Don't wait till next year. Do it now, if you don't already. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I'm so grateful to You. I'm grateful to You, Lord, for the privilege of sharing this message. Not just Christmas cheer, Lord, even though we are rejoicing and cheerful. Not just the euphoria, even though this is a wonderful time of the year for us to be believers. But more than this, that you gave your son here on this earth, born in a horse trough, humiliated and humbled to the very ground that he might be exalted over all. And I pray, Lord, that you would examine the hearts of each person here, that they might look on you and see the perfect and only God and put their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, that they might have eternal life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. God, let that be our message this year, that we might believe it and still believe it every day. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.